the music score on any film is obviously vitally important because it totally guides your emotions when you're watching the film. I mean, the actors can do their job, the director can do their job in terms of creating a certain amount of mood and emotion, but obviously music is like so strong in evoking what you should be feeling at any given time. Peter and Fran were very clear that they wanted someone that would collaborate with them, that would be willing to invest the time to develop themes and to help us even in production. Because more so than just scoring the film, I wanted the music to reflect Tolkien. I wanted the music to also bring the world of Middle Earth to life. So Howard agreed to come down and meet with Peter. And he visited the set. And he visited the set again a few, mo few months later, and he was just started to immerse himself in the world very, very quickly once, once he'd agreed to do the film. You could see the depth and the creativity of what they were trying to create in New Zealand and the passion for it. And I think it was on that very first trip that I had decided that I definitely wanted to do the film. It seemed like a hugely daunting task to do three films. Normally on movies, composers might work for six or eight weeks. But Howard was with us um, from very early on in the shoot. So, you know, by the time The Fellowship of the Ring had been released, Howard had been on the film for nearly two years. Tolkien spent 14 years writing Lord of the Rings. And you're now writing a musical image, creating the music, a musical mirror, if you will, uh, to, to his writing. And I mention this so, so often, um, you know, even in, in other discussions about feeling like Frodo, and I really did feel like that, that I had this amazing a journey to take and I had the ring in my vest pocket and you were chosen now you're gonna write the music to Lord of the Rings and uh, you had to do it. It was more than what we could have ever dreamt really because you know Howard has become part of our family part of our team on this film and he is totally devoted to to somehow um, give the music a cultural significance. Uh, a section of the Encyclopedia of Moria just so you understand to give you some idea of this particular world that we're trying to create. Uh, Moria, it's in the year 1697, the second age of the sun. So that it's doing two jobs at the same time. And one, it's underscoring the film. It's providing an emotional link, a bridge between the movie and the audience. And it's drawing the audience in. But it's doing it in such a way that it's also telling you a lot about the cultures of this world. Mm -hmm. We don't really have the ability in the movies to use the songs and the poems to the extent that Professor Tolkien did in his books. But we are obviously trying to acknowledge that and to make it part of the texture and fabric of the movies. Rushing Carty, who was the uh, linguist on the film, she would do the pronunciation. When I first met Viggo Mortensen, who plays Aragorn, it was the first thing he said, he wanted to sing this song. He's made up the tune himself. He wanted to give it a Celtic feel. And he's taken to the Elvish language like a duck to water. In Elvish, it's Tinuviel Elvanui, Elleth Alfirin Evelhail, Ohon Ring Finnil Fuinui, Arenk Gelebrin Thilion. Who is she? We sat around our kitchen table at home talking about the choral ideas for Moria. And, um, and, I, and I thought it would be really great to weight it fairly heavily towards Polynesian singers, Maoris or Pacific Islanders, who have an, and gain another otherworldly quality to their voice. Mines being a dwarven kingdom would really um, suit having a sort of male voice. It's a bit like a Welsh mining choir. And they're singing in this ancient uh, dwarvish language. So these 60 guys, you know, chanting these uh, dwarvish verses. A demon of the ancient world. And then I augmented it at the end with actual football players. So they were looking for some grunty voices and they thought that a kapahaka flavor would fit in with it. So Howard basically, you know, found himself in the Wellington Town Hall in New Zealand with an all Polynesian male choir.
Fran also became involved in the music. She, she wrote the lyrics for the song that is sung during the closing credits of the film, um, In Dreams, it's called. She helped Howard direct the boys' choir. It was a London school choir with a wonderful young boy. Edward Ross, he's probably about 12 years old. He represented the boys, and it was a boy soloist for the choir. That song was recorded in the, uh, the number two studio at Abbey Road, which is where the Beatles did all their recording. And um, as a huge Beatles fan, I'm, uh, I was incredibly thrilled to be there, find myself there recording a song for our movie. We wanted to have some featured vocalists within the music as well, more so than just the choirs. And Enya's music has always been, you know, closely related to Tolkien. And I wrote the beginning of it, where you see Arwen with uh, Strider. I wrote that little introduction that leads into it, and then she wrote that vocal piece, much like the way I was orchestrating the rest of the score. The Lothlorien music, the the, um, the music of the elves in Lothlorien, we deliberately gave it a slightly Eastern flavor. It has some very exotic African instruments playing and some East Indian I instruments playing in it as well. One of my great joys was to get to work with Howard Shaw and write some lyrics for his incredible score. Philippa wrote a lot of the choral pieces that Howard needed for his, the various parts of the film. Um, you know, whether they were elven choral or dwarf choral or, or you know, the vocals. We wanted um, a song for Lothlorien as well, although we didn't think it was appropriate to use Enya in both places because we wanted the music to feel like Enya belonged to one part of the elvish world and we wanted a different voice for Lothlorien just to make them feel very separate. And Elizabeth Frazier, she has the most wonderful voice and ability to create this very ethereal sound with her voice. Even now, there is hope left. The Revelation of the Ring Race is a poem that Philippa Boynes wrote. They were sent to David Sallow, who's a Tolkien scholar. He would translate them into the appropriate languages. In the case of this, it was translated into Andunaic, which was the ancient speech of men. Isengard is the industrial age, and it's written in 5-4 to evoke this kind of things being a little off kilter. I mean, the 5-4 rhythm is a little unusual, that it always felt a bit unresolved. The ring has uh, many different voices in the music, so I use the sound of the boy choir of the seduction of the ring, because I thought that that Part of the seduction of it, I thought, was the regaining of a lost life. Follow me. It is a strange fate that we should suffer so much for nothing. For the evil of the ring, when Gimli tries to destroy the ring, hear that evilness to it and the black speech coming out of it. And then there's the, uh, just the sheer power of the ring. You hear it uh, in the prologue. I want to feel something when I watch the film. And that's how I create music. I mean, that I'm watching the film and feeling something and trying to create that in music. It's like the creation of the fellowship. As the two hobbits leave Hobbiton and they set out on their own, 
and you hear the first statement of the fellowship theme in the cornfield because it's essentially the first time the fellowship is formed. Finally, the fellowship being formed to support Frodo to take the ring in Rivendale. It's a very magic moment in the film. And Elrond says that you will now be the fellowship of the ring and the music just swells and you just hear that fully formed version of the fellowship theme. You never hear that true heroic version um, anymore after Gandalf falls. It's now disintegrating and Frodo's on the beach and you hear the last version of the fellowship theme. What I'm doing now is writing 30 minutes of new music. I don't think anybody's ever done that. I think it's, it might be a first where the composer has gone back and re recorded new music for new scenes that are wonderful scenes that give a lot more backstory to some of the cultures. The music for the Fellowship of the Ring is going to be related, obviously, directly to the Two Towers and the Return of the King. I mean, I'm sure there'll be a day when it'll be very, you know, it'll be an interesting day to listen to the music of all three films because I know that Howard it does see this as being his, the opportunity in his life to, to basically create a um, opera. Taking it out of the context of what we think of film music and what we think of as opera. So if you think you're writing an opera piece, you don't think of it as in cues, but you think of the, a, a, a much larger structure that has to have that cohesive shape. But if you go to the opera, you've watched Fellowship, which is act one, the curtain has come down, and you've gone out to intermission, you've had a drink or a snack or something, and now you've gone back and you're sitting in your seat, the curtain's going up for act two. And that, that will happen uh, December 2002.